Jesus' name, chains will fall, prison 
shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark. Just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom. Let there be freedom. Praise like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting for you. Praise like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Shout like the chains have been broken. He did it. He did it. Shout like the chains have been broken. He did it. He did it. Shout Come like on, the if you've got a testimony this morning, he did why don't you lift your voice? Why don't you lift your hands? Shout like the chains have been broken. He did it. He did it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom, let there be freedom. Sunday morning, New Year's Eve, we preached on discipleship regardless. Cast some vision for the 2024 year and where we feel we're headed and the things that God is going to do for us and the things we're going to do for Him. So uh, you're going to hear that theme repeatedly, discipleship regardless. Whatever happens on the economic level, the financial level, the social level, the cultural level, the uh, geopolitical level. It doesn't matter what happens this year. What we want to be focused on is the field, the harvest. And we can do that by being disciplers. Amen? Don't forget last Sunday morning, uh, about 80 came forward with a commitment, God, if you'll put somebody in my path, I will do my due diligence in entering into a relationship with them, befriending them, and over coffee and cake, be able to sit down on a regular basis, once a week, once every two weeks, and spend time with that individual and invest in them, answer their questions, pray with them, see spiritual progress in their lives, and I believe if you will continue with that commitment. God's going to put somebody in your path. And uh, just remember, it's not about you, it's about them. So if God puts them in your path, it's not about you getting a friend, it's about you being a friend. And if you'll work on that, God will help you with that. Amen. Praise God. If we could stand to our feet. I want to talk about a subject today, entrusted with a treasure entrusted with a treasure. I'm reading from Psalm chapter 127, verse 3. The Bible says, Lo, children, your children, my children, our grandchildren, children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. When God thinks up the best way he can bless you, 
And that is by sending you a child, sending you a boy, sending you a girl. You need to know, according to that passage, lo, children are a heritage. That word heritage in the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, it means something inherited. It means an heirloom. It means an estate as if inheriting it. Or it means inheriting a portion. So in other words, we're talking about value here. And when it comes to families passing on their assets, we're talking about treasures. Um, In other words, your children, my children, are our treasure. They are a treasure to us. I've heard it said before, and I think there's some truth to it. You know, the only thing you can take with you to heaven are your children. And there's some truth to that, especially when they are small. We are entrusted with a treasure. Let's pray. God, right now, in the name of the Lord, God, we need you this morning. We need you to talk to us. We need you to speak to us through the word of God. I pray that you would help me, Lord, to share the thoughts, the ideals, the opinions, the the principles, Lord, that you've put in my mind concerning this subject. And I pray you would help me to share it in a way that we're receptive to it. Help us, Lord, to take it and apply it and see the significance of it. God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Entrusted with a treasure. It was a while back, I don't know, several months ago, I did a little study on the book of Ezra. It's never been my favorite book. It's in the middle of the Bible, and it's a small book, a short book, and on my part has been tended to be overlooked. And so I did a study on it a while back, and I found some interesting things about it. Some of that I want to share with you this morning. You know, um, I don't know if you're a history buff, uh, if you are. Uh, this will mean something to you. I don't want to bore you with statistics, but I do want to kind of bring you up to speed so we can set the stage here for what I need to tell you. When you go back in Jewish history, you'll find that in 586 B.C., after many warnings by God through Hebrew prophets, the Babylonians came, invaded Palestine or Canaan, and of course conquered the city of Jerusalem. They tore down the walls, they ripped the temple apart, Uh, that was Solomon's temple. They basically leveled it to the foundation. That was in 586 B.C. The Persians later conquered the Babylonians, world empires, And a king, a Persian king, by the name of Cyrus, whom the Bible actually prophesied, would become a friend of the Jewish people. Cyrus the Great, during his reign, he authorized a return of the Jewish people back to their roots, back to Canaan, especially back to Jerusalem, and gave the Jews both permission and the resources to rebuild the Jewish temple and also to restore and rebuild the walls surrounding Jerusalem. Uh, History tells us that even Cyrus the Great footed the bill through his own Persian treasury for those large stones that make up the foundation of Zerubbabel's temple. We're talking about stones as big as a Greyhound bus. He's the one who footed the bill for those stones to be hewn and put in place along with the the treasures or the, the trees of Lebanon timbers that were used in that rebuilt temple. Or in other words, the Jews had a friend among the Persian kings. We know that Zerubbabel in about 537 B.C., uh, he with 50,000 people 
came to Jerusalem and it was Cyrus who handed back over to Zerubbabel all of the temple furnishings, all of the temple furniture, all of the utensils used in the worship of Jehovah God. All of that was given back to Zerubbabel and they took with them in that large group, back to Jerusalem. And when they got there, they started laying the foundation again of the Jewish temple. Now, uh, Ezra, then in 458 B.C., he came along with another Persian king and another large group of people And his idea was to get back to Jerusalem and assist in building the walls and wrapping up the temple and restoring Jerusalem to its former glory. He did this by the king Artaxerus I. And he was the grandson of Cyrus of Persia. And so this grandson who was now king was again favorable toward the Jewish people and sent Ezra with this large group who made the trip. And then, of course, if you keep reading in your Bible, you get into the book of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah several years later returned to Jerusalem with a group and finished up the walls of Jerusalem and made it safe again. So that's kind of the history here that we're looking at. When we look at the time of Ezra, after the arrival of Ezra in Jerusalem, the Jews began to lay the foundation and continue Zerubbabel's work and did some work on the surrounding Walls. And the Bible tells us, just stick with me, that the pagan communities around Jerusalem got up in arms about this. As long as the walls are down and the temple's not rebuilt, the Jewish people are scattered to the four winds and we never have to worry about Jerusalem rising up again as a source of political power. But you let Jerusalem rebuild their temple, you let Jerusalem rebuild their walls so that they can protect themselves, then we might have an adversary that we have to deal with in the future. And so these pagan communities Unity sent a letter back to Artaxerus, the king, back in Persia and basically said, you don't want to let these people do that. In fact, they claimed in their letter to the king that these people in Jerusalem, these Jewish people, they're problem people, they're troubled people, these are rebellious people. And if you let them rebuild their walls and let them rebuild their temple, they will stop submitting to you as king. And they'll no longer pay their taxes and their tribute to Persia as required. Well, when the king got this letter, you know, he's 500 miles away. And so he sends his Persian scribes into the archives, Persian archives, to go search out uh, in writing, is there anything to these accusations about the Jewish people and the restoration of Jerusalem? Uh, The letter that the pagan community sent to the king, it reads uh, verses 12 and 13 of Ezra chapter 4. Let me just read it to you. They said, hey, the king, you need to know that the Jews who come here to Jerusalem from Babylon, they're rebuilding this rebellious and evil city. They have already laid the foundation and will soon finish its walls. The king should know that if this city is rebuilt and if its walls are complete, it will be much to your disadvantage for the Jews will then refuse to pay your tribute, customs, and tolls to you as required. And so, of course, the scribes, they go into the archives and they start digging all this out. And you know what? Come to find out there are some problems with Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem was once led by some very strong kings. There was, there was uh, David and there was Solomon and there was Hezekiah. They also found out that in the archives as attacked and accused that, yes, during Judah's declining years right there in the area of Jerusalem, they did often break treaties with surrounding nations. For instance, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and the Babylonians, they broke those treaties. Just go read a little bit about the Judean king and their relationships with the surrounding nations. And they, they, it is true that, that the Jewish people, Jerusalem at one time, refused to pay tribute back to Assyria and to Babylon. And so here's King Artaxerxes. He's got now this information that the accusations of the pagan communities are not far from the truth there. And so what they need to do is we probably need to put a halt to all of this. And when you read your Bible, you find out that that's exactly what happened. For about 10 years, all work ceased on the Temple Mount and on the walls of Jerusalem by Artaxerxes' decree. But then during a later investigation, and I won't go into the detail, uh, there were two Jewish prophets that had some say-so in it. They did another investigation and Artaxerxes, the king, discovered that Cyrus the Great, a Persian king who was his granddaddy, had indeed freed the Jewish people, had authorized their return to Jerusalem. Cyrus the Great, it's in the Bible, it's prophecy, had authorized the rebuilding of the Jewish temple and the resetting of the walls of Jerusalem and in fact had given money from the Persian treasury to make sure that it all happened. And so here's our taxerist. His head is swimming by now. And because of his loyalty to his grandfather, he honored the wishes of King Cyrus. And the Jews now are being allowed to go back into Jerusalem and continue the work. And so that is the setting here that's going on in Ezra. And I do believe that this is speaking to us. For instance, it is true. Israel was a problem for the surrounding pagan cultures. It is true that Israel didn't want to bow the knee to Baal. It is true that Israel didn't want to be uh, associated and connected with idol worshipers. It is true that Israel, the Jewish people, are a proud, independent lot who refused to live under the iron hand of outside countries and nations. And so there's, in a sense, it is true. We can't deny it. And I'm talking about us. Like the tribe of Judah, like the people of God, the church has always resisted every effort on the part of the world to be controlled and dominated by its world system. It's true. We admit it. We can't deny it. And when I'm saying the world, I'm not talking about the 8 billion people that live on this planet. I'm not talking about the varied cultures and nations and communities spread across seven continents. I'm not talking about that at all. When I say the world, I'm talking about the world system that is dominated and controlled and manipulated by Satan. I'm talking about a world system that the church to this day is still resisting and still praying against. It is true. We admit it. We refuse to bow the knee to Baal. We're not going to bend, we're not going to bow, and we're not going to balk. Talking about the church and its relationship to the world. When you go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, the Bible makes it entirely clear. Uh, uh, John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That system. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And what's in the world? All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so just like 
the pagans of Ezra's day against the people of God, so does the world system have a problem with the church. And if you want to know why we build walls, it's because we're not trying to keep the people in. Oh, I wish you'd get with me. We're trying to keep the world out. Let's talk a minute about some walls. Walls in Bible days were built not to keep the population in, but to keep the enemy out. Without walls around your city, the city cannot be protected from outside attack. When it comes to the church, without walls, without boundaries, without rules, without lifestyle, without guidelines. The church provides absolutely no guidance as to how we are to live a godly life in this sin-sick world. As apostolics, we teach guidelines. We believe something. We believe in separation from the world. We believe in building walls to keep the world out. What are we trying to do? We're trying to help you establish guidelines in your home for your own family, for your own children, so that they can succeed you as apostolic, not just in talk, but also in their walk. We're not trying to control you. We're not trying to control your family. Sometimes we get blamed for that. We get accused of that. that, Yeah, you apostolics, you Pentecostal people, you're always trying to tell everybody how to live. And it's not so much we're trying to control our families, uh, trying to control our homes. Uh, It's more so just trying to keep the things of the world out. Somebody needs to hear me. We are not dictators. But neither are we diplomats. In other words, we're not here as a body of believers. We're not here for the purpose to mix, to mingle, to compromise our values, our doctrines, our faith, our belief system. We are trying to establish a wall of protection so that you have a chance to Save your family. We're trying to establish healthy homes that will assist you in raising your children and the fear of God, holding your kid, holding on to your kids and an otherwise godless age and hour. We're not here to conform to the world's expectations. We're not here to try to please the world. We're not here to come up to the world's demands. We are here committed to transforming the lives of our homes and our families to be more like Jesus. That's what the church is all about. It's more than just coming together and getting a good song going and getting the drums going and us just hoop and holler together. We are a body of believers who believe something. And we're trying our best to hold on to our homes and our families. Which means uh, there are going to be times you're going to be diametrically opposed to the world system. And they're not going to like it. And you're going to be critiqued and criticized and chastised for it. Bottom line. You know, so many people live today like they lived in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 17 verse 6. The Bible says, And in those days there was no king in Israel. There was no leadership. There was no one voice. There was no accountability. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And you go ahead and you read the book of Judges in that light. And you'll see the mess that people kept getting into. Because there's no one voice, there's no guidance, there's no direction. We all understand it was years ago that the world threw the Bible out of our school system. We get that. They threw out the Bible. And so therefore now in this culture, there is no simple standard of how to behave 
or what to compare their lives to. It's just, if it feels good, do it. With no accountability, with no thought of tomorrow, the repercussions, the consequences. It's every man who's doing that which is right in his own eyes. There's no one authority in our culture telling us what is right and what is wrong. And for those churches that are taking a stand, you've got the pagans uh, who are pointing their fingers at the church and saying, you're just a bunch of troublemakers. And we probably are. <laughs> you ever been to Outback? Their theme is no rules, just right. That's the way our world wants to live. How about Burger King? I haven't been there in a while, but have it your way. At Burger King, well, there are a lot of people. That's exactly what they want. They want life their way. There are a lot of people today They don't care how everybody else lives. They don't care which direction society is heading in. They don't care about anything in the way of brevity and sobriety and godliness and separation. In fact, their attitude is, whatever floats your boat. And they don't care how anybody else is living and what anybody else is doing. We are living in a day and an hour where it's absolute chaos. In this world, all the conflicting ideals and opinions on what's right and what's wrong. And so what I want to do this morning for 2024, I want to set the record straight for our church family, who we are, our identity, our culture, and what we believe. And I think what we need to remember this morning is what matters to God is that you start and that you finish. That's what matters to God. Let me read it to you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 5. The Bible says, And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And watch this. It's very strange language. Watch this. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. They went forth into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. They started by leaving Haran. They finished by getting to Canaan. And you go look in your Bible and you read about the life of Abraham. What you won't find is you won't find any inside information as to what happened between Haran and Canaan. Nothing. They spent five to six months making that journey from Haran to Canaan. There's nothing said about what happened to them. The encounters, the the trouble, the setbacks, the issues, there's nothing said about that six-month journey 500 miles between Haran and Canaan. Nothing is said about what we would obviously know. Nothing said about the biting winds. Nothing is said about the searing heat. Nothing is said or spoken about the sandy deserts, the armed robbers, or the sparse grazing for their herds. Nothing is said about their worries that they had to have articulated when they were at night in their tents. They would have asked questions like, are we really strong enough to fend off the highway robbers? Well, I guess we'll find out. That would have been one of their concerns. They would have asked questions like, hey, Abe, do we even know where we're going? And they didn't. God said, just go and I'll tell you when you get there. Go read your Bible. They would have asked questions like, do you think God will tell us when we actually arrive? I hope so. They would have asked questions like, what are the people like where we are going to settle? Will they fight us? Will they buck us? Will they accept us? Will they be good for us? Will they be a bad influence? These were things that these people would have asked at that time. 
And so here's my suggestion, here's my conclusion on why there's nothing said about that six months and what happened to them during that long journey. The reason no attention is given to the 500-mile, six-month journey between Haran and Canaan is because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As far as God was concerned, the only thing that mattered was that they started their journey and that they ended their journey where they were supposed to. I really believe we need to pick something out of that. I think if God needed more information about that six-month time period, God would have made sure that information got in the Bible. But it's not there. And it must be because at least as far as God is concerned, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we get all worked up over stuff that's happening now that doesn't matter. What matters is not the little details that go on between the beginning of our journey and the end of our journey between here on earth and what we call the new Jerusalem. What matters, the only thing that matters, as Cliff was saying earlier, what really matters is that you've started your journey and that when the trumpet sounds, you're there at the finish line. That's what's important here. See, the Bible tells us that God brings us out in order to bring us in. If you want to know why God saved you, it's not because uh, he liked the way you combed your hair. It's not because he was partial to your middle name. It's not because uh, you're something special in that sense. Uh, the, The Bible tells us very clearly that God brings us out of the world so that he can bring us into the kingdom. That's the bottom line. Let me read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 23. The Bible says, but he brought us out from there to bring us in. He brought us out to bring us in. He brought us out of Egypt in order to bring us into Canaan to give us the land that he promised the oath to our forefathers. God brought Israel out of Egyptian bondage so that he might bring them into Canaan. Everything between those two extremes is nothing but a side note. What was crucial is that they left Egypt and they got to Canaan. There are people in this building... I get it, I understand it. Life can be hard, can be cruel, can be tough. And at times we wonder about what we are going through now. It's so dominant and controlling in our thinking. It seems to overpower us. We are immersed in problems and situations and setbacks. What you need to hear, what you need to know is whatever you're going through right now is nothing more than a blip on God's screen between you starting your journey and you finishing your journey. And you get on the other side of the rapture, there's going to be a lot of stuff. You're going to wonder, why did I waste all my time worrying, stewing, fretting, fussing, fighting over all this stuff? There are going to be things we're going to deal with in this, in this world. You're here this morning, and maybe for you it's your empty nest. Maybe for you it's your debilitating illness. Maybe for you it's your lonely nights. Maybe for you, sir, it's your struggling business. Maybe it's that lousy job that you feel tied at the hip to. Maybe it's your worried mind. Maybe it's those strained relationships. Maybe it's those wayward kids. And and what you need to remember is that all of that is nothing but a puff of wind compared to the fact that you started and that you finish. As my wife is good about saying, this too will pass. The only thing that matters to me, what I'm seeing out of the scriptures here, is that have you started your journey? 
And are you going to be there at the finish line? That's the only thing that matters here. You know, we know nothing about Abraham's journey from Haran to Canaan. Did you know the same could be said about Ezra and his entourage and their trip from Persia to Jerusalem? Did you know it could be said the same thing? Let me read it to you. Ezra chapter 8 verse 31. The Bible says, Ezra speaking, and we departed from the river of Ahava in Persia on the twelfth day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. And then it says, verse 32, and we came to Jerusalem. That's it. You mean five months of traveling between Persia and Jerusalem, and that's all you can say about the trip? We left on the 12th day of the first month. We're on our way to Jerusalem, and guess what? We came to Jerusalem five months later. You know why he says that? It's because that's the only thing that matters. Now, if you want a little bit of a detail, there's a little hint that there was stuff that happened during those months. But we don't, we're not privy to it. What does it say? It said, oh, he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. Well, what does that mean? We don't know. Because it's not important enough to put in the Bible. Because it doesn't matter when it comes to God. The only thing that matters is that they left on the 12th day of the first month and they arrived in Jerusalem five months later. Now, if you want to get into detail about Ezra's trip, here's what we need to focus on. Here's what would be important. The Bible says, it gives us detail, that along with Ezra and the number of people that were there, nobody knows, that they were responsible, Cliff, for this vast treasure hoard that our taxerists gave to them out of the Persian treasury. Things were returned to the Jewish people that had originally belonged to them. Let me read to you. Ezra chapter 8 verse 24. The Bible says, I appointed 12 leaders, Ezra speaking, of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and the 10 other priests to be in charge of transporting, ooh, wow, the silver, the gold, the gold bowls, and other items that the king, his council, his officials, and all the people of Israel had presented for the temple of God. And I weighed the treasure as I gave it to them and found the totals to be as follows. Are you ready? This is the New Living Translation. 24 tons of silver. By today's standards, that would be about $16 million today. But that wasn't all. We find also that there were 7,500 pounds of silver artifacts that the commentators think was attached or connected to the temple. And the silver utensils and tools and things that were used in the temple worship, those silver artifacts, temple treasure. And if it's temple treasure... In many cases, it might even be considered priceless. Watch this, 7,500 pounds of gold. There are 16 ounces of, uh, of, of gold in every pound. Or in other words, by today's dollars, $184 million was handed over to Ezra and that entourage. And then it talks about gold bowls equal in value to 1,000 gold coins. That'd be $2 million at today's prices. And then there, whatever these were, two fine articles of polished brass as precious as gold. What are you saying, Pastor Hires? I'm saying that Ezra and this group returning to Jerusalem could have had in their possession upwards of the equivalent of $500 million worth of gold, silver, bronze artifacts that they were taking back to Jerusalem. 
that treasure would do what? That treasure would help them rebuild the temple, finish it up, and help them rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Wow. When you think about it, this return of national treasure to the Jews, those utensils, those artifacts, that furniture, those things that were given back to them would be used later in a resurrected temple for upcoming generations of Jews to participate in their worship and their sacrifice. This treasure would allow a continuation of the sacrifices conducted on the Temple Mount for generations to come. Future generations would depend upon these Jews who were now escorting upwards of half a billion dollars in treasure. And future generations of Jews would enjoy all of that. But the Bible does say that they had problems getting the treasure from Persia to Jerusalem. Just that hint, and that's all we know. You know, you need to understand, just like the Jews, Ezra, that entourage, that threatened treasure, just like there was an enemy waiting for them in their day and hour. You need to hear it. There's an enemy that's waiting for us. We, I'm talking about the church, the body of Christ, individuals. We have been given a treasure. We've been given a treasure. And the enemy wants your treasure and wants that treasure bad. That treasure you hold If you're a father, you're a mother, is of vast, unfathomable value. You can't put a dollar sign on it. And that treasure is your children and my children. It could be said, and there's some truth to it nothing else matters, Cliff, if our kids aren't saved. There won't be a whole lot of stuff that really matters if our kids don't make the trip with us. And so we've got to make sure that between the fact that we start and the fact that we finish, we have a treasure that's been entrusted to us. And our children are going to spend eternity somewhere. I don't know about you. I want to raise my children in the house of God among the people of God. I want my children to ensure that we're going to have a future as a church body and as an organization. I want to know that our children are going to come up off these pews and they're going to become our next generation's preachers and teachers and pastors and pastors' wives and workers. That's what I want to see. I want to know that the church is going to continue. I want to know the church is going to move forward. I want to know that our children are going to populate those roles and jobs and responsibilities into the future. Just as future generations of Jews would enjoy the sacrifice and the commitment of Ezra and his people bringing that treasure there. So also do we need to recognize the value. I'm not living for God for myself. I'm also living for God for my kids. I'm living for God for my grandchildren. I want to see them make it. Let's stand to our feet. We will ensure the continuation of the church of the living God if we keep our children close. If we raise our children in the house of God, we'll keep our apostolic doctrines. We'll keep our Pentecostal lifestyle. We'll keep our commitment to separation. We'll pass it on to our children if our children are here to receive it. See, our treasure is what's going to ensure our future. 
If we can't keep our kids on the pews, if we can't get our kids Holy Ghost filled, if we can't get our kids in the baptistry to be baptized, if we can't teach our kids ministry and lifestyle and allow for truth and doctrine, we have no future. We die off and the church dwindles and closes its doors. It's happening all over North America and Europe. I know what I'm talking about. It's been said, and I think there's some truth to it, Cliff. We're always just one generation from extinction. If we don't pass on who we are, what we are, what we believe to our kids, one generation later, poof, it all goes up in smoke. So in other words, what I'm saying, at the end of the day, there's so much we bicker over and fight about and fuss over and we give thought to and, and, and give resources to are things that don't even matter. The only thing that's going to matter at the sound of the trumpet is that you started your journey and you made it to the finish line and you brought your treasure with you. It's the only thing that's going to matter. Everything in between, your conversion and the rapture, I'm not discounting it. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying in the big picture, it's not even a blip on the screen. What matters it's how you live, how you die. 2024, we need to decide what we're going to do. We need to decide what we're going to give our time and attention and thought life to. In 2024, I don't want to get swept up into stuff that doesn't matter and doesn't count. I hope you know it. 2024 is going to be a volatile year for us. I'm talking about our culture. I'm talking about North America. I'm talking about our country. 2024 is going to be volatile. We are going to elect a person for the office of President of the United States this year. There's going to be a whole lot of rhetoric. There's going to be a lot of fuming and fussing and fighting. There's going to be a whole lot of mudslinging. There's going to be a whole lot of hanky-panky going on politically and legally. Do you really want to get wrapped up in all of that in 2024? I don't. You know, another pandemic could put us right again at the brink of the world economy shutting down again. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to go there. But they're saying it could happen. Are we going to spend all of our time fussing and fighting over viruses and vaccines? Well, come on now. Or are we going to choose to decide what's important to me. And what's important to me is that I started my journey and that I'm there at the finish line and I hear the trumpet sound and I've got my treasure with me. That's all that's going to matter. Twenty twenty five, twenty twenty four. It's supposed to be the year that they have designated our switch over to digital money on a global scale. Could happen. It may not. It could. What are we going to do? Here's what I say politics, culture, finances are all important subjects. We need to be awake and we need to be alert and we need to be informed. But I say, as far as our time and our attention and our prayer and our focus, it needs to be on things that matter in 2024. 
In 2024, I need to be concerned about my relationship with the Lord and my family and putting up some walls and keeping the world at bay and, 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 and making sure that my children are exposed to truth and godliness and righteousness rather than worldliness and confusion and gender identity. All that goes with that. I need to make sure that I've got some walls up. That's what I want to be concerned about this year. What I want to be concerned about is the harvest that God's going to give us in 2024. Your family members, your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors that are going to come into this church and be spirit-filled and water-baptized. That's what I want to focus my attention on challenging you. And at the end of the day, I started my journey, I ended my journey, and I got my treasure with me. My kids are safe. My kids are saved. One minute after the rapture, it won't matter who won the 2024 presidential election. One minute after the rapture, it won't matter if we adequately prepared our finances for a future digital economy. It won't matter. One minute after the rapture, it won't matter who won the woke war with companies like Disney, and Target, and Bud Light. It won't matter. One minute after the rapture. One minute after the rapture, it won't matter if the World Economic Forum gets its stranglehold on the world's economy and bends its will. It won't matter. Because I started my journey, I got to the finish line, my treasure's with me. All that's going to matter in this dispensation is that we began and we ended. We started our journey and we arrived at our destination. Everything else you're dealing with now, while it's important to you today, put it in perspective. It won't matter one minute after the trumpet sounds. I want us to close our eyes all over the building. Holy Ghost is here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. I want us to pray right now that God would help us. That whatever we do in this life, that we don't lose sight of what's important. That as much as 2024 brings us in the way of opportunities and setbacks, that we're not going to let 2024 and its shallow ideals corrupt us. We're going to keep our eye on the prize. We're going to stay focused on the harvest. God's going to use us mightily in 2024. People's lives are going to be changed and transformed by the word of God. Let's pray. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, these are good people in this building. These are good families. Families who have sacrificed families who some for years have put you first. People who have endured the scrutiny and criticism of the world and their peers in order to live a godly life and to believe the word of God is true. God, I thank you for every one of them. I thank you for every brother and sister. I thank you for every family that's a part of POD here. God, we don't know what we're going to be facing in 2024. We don't know exactly what's coming down the line for us politically, socially, culturally, financially. But God, I pray that in the midst of all the confusion and chaos and distraction, I pray, oh Lord, that the POD, that we keep our heart focused on the the loss, we keep our mind on the field, keep our hands in the harvest 
that we devote ourselves to making sure above all else we bring our treasure with us. Here's what I'm asking. If you're a father in the building, if you're a mother in the building, if you're a husband and wife, you have children, I'm asking if you would, I'm asking you to come down and we're going to gather here together as families. I, I, I don't do this lightly. I do this seriously. I think God honors the fact that we step up to the plate. We come down to the front. It means something to us that our kids are going to be saved. I'm asking you if you would, if you're a father, if you're a mother, if you're a grandfather, if you're a grandmother, I'm asking if you would come down. You don't have to kneel if you don't want to, but we're going to pray. And we're going to pray a prayer that God will help us to have the wisdom the spiritual sensitivity we need to set the parameters and the boundaries and the walls in our home so that we can preserve our kids, so that we can keep our kids. Can we pray right now, God, in your name, I come before you, oh Lord Jesus. Lord, we don't claim to be perfect. Lord, we're flawed from stem to stern. But Lord, we also know, Lord, that we are people of the name. Lord, you called us into the kingdom for such a time as this. God, we have children who are following us. We have children who look to us for direction and guidance and help how to navigate this godless world. I pray in the name of Jesus in 2024, oh Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength, the spiritual sensitivity, the awareness of the world system. Lord, an understanding of what we are confronted with. I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus, like never before in 2024, help us, Lord, to be a separated people, a godly people, a consecrated people, a people, Lord, who not only believe this truth, but we're passing it on to our treasure, our children, and their children. God, help me to remember heaven won't be heaven if my kids aren't there. Heaven won't be what heaven could be if my grandchildren don't make it. Help me, Lord, to do whatever I've got to do to ensure that the treasure makes it with me to the finish line.
Every hand lifted in this house. Why don't we lift up the names, our children, our sons, and our daughters? Why don't we get the parents in this house? Lift up your voice. Let's cover our children, grandparents, grandfather, grandmother. Why don't we cover them in prayer? There's a 